So I'm from the Tuberculosis Training Center. We have the AIDS Education and Training Center represented, and we also have another training center represented, which is the STD HIV Prevention Training Center. Our speaker now, Candace McNeil, an infectious disease doc who's worked in STD and infectious diseases since her training, um, comes to us from Wake Forest University. And it's my pleasure to turn it over to Candace. Thank you for joining us today. All right, so um, it's great to be out here. I must say you guys have awesome weather. Um, I have a lot of, I know that that might be funny to you guys, but where I came from, this is awesome. Um, so I have a lot of content here. And the good thing is, you know, as HIV practitioners, you probably know a lot of this stuff. So definitely if there's something that you're interested in knowing a little bit more, let me know. Um, so let's get started. I have no conflicts. Um, so I will be discussing a few off-label, can you guys hear me? A few off-label items. And these include um, using um, the NAT testing for extra genital sites, as well as testing for T. vaginalis. Um, so the 2015 uh, guidelines, so you probably heard over the last couple of years that these guidelines were coming out and it took a while. Well, they were reviewed in 2013 and they were actually published in um, June of 2015, and they're evidence-based guidelines, and what, what they're looking at is microbiologic eradication. Um, we're looking at alleviation of symptoms and signs. We're looking at prevention of sequelae and prevention of transmission. So they are, there is some order to the madness. Um, when you look at those boxes, for the most part, they're going to be in alphabetical order unless there's some reason they want you to use one treatment over the other, then they'll flip the order in the box. So you're supposed to be a little psychic and figure that out, but for the most part, just follow the treatments as according to how they're listed in the box. Um, and then for the purposes of this talk, um, I've tried to put some of the preferred regimens in boxes and highlight them in yellow, so all these other cues as well. So my objectives, they are many, and I might not accomplish all of them, but um, I'd like to review the current screening guidelines, also talk about some SCD um, syndromes in the HIV-infected patients that you might want to be able to identify, talk about um, diagnostic testing for Neisseria gonorrhea in the setting of emerging resistance, talk about the spectrum of NGU and also some emerging pathogens in that area, and uh, testing for T. vaginalis, look at syphilis a little bit in more detail, and if we get to it, some HPV prevention. So STDs and HIV are common bedfellows, and we've known this for a while. So um, this study by, um, by Meyer et al. was published in Sexually Transmitted Diseases, basically looked at 557 HIV-infected patients that were in primary care in four big cities. They were screened initially and then later on in the study, and they found that at baseline, 13% had an STD. 7% of new STDs at six months, and 94% of them had incident STDs, and they were MSMs. And not surprisingly, these were at extra genital sites. So this is why it's so important to look outside of the urine and the penis area for um, STDs. 20% of all MSM diagnosed with an STD at baseline. They were also, um, also by six months as well. So another thing that we're seeing is HIV and syphilis diagnosis are increasing. Um, so this study, this is from 2011, um, I should say this article is from 2011, but basically looked at a survey over two time periods, and um, what they found were primary and secondary cases of syphilis were increasing, um, up to 70% in some areas. The average increases were highest amongst black men, um, and these were uh, HIV amongst, these included HIV infection and really high rates of syphilis within this group. And we know this based on current data as well. This is a high-risk group that we really need to be aware of and we need to screen them. So STDs facilitate HIV transmission, and this is not a pleasant situation to be in, of course. Um, so what they can do is they can disrupt the epithelia and the mucosal barrier, therefore um, leaving you more predisposed to getting an infection. There can be increased numbers of HIV target cells in the genital tract increased expression of HIV co-receptors, um, and increased HIV shedding as well. And HIV can alter the natural history of some STDs. So when we look at uh, herpes, for example, in this population, we can see that in HIV-infected patients, they might have increased um, morbidity related to this, increased persistence of their symptoms, increased virus shedding, 
and you know part of this is related to their immune status but it's definitely something that um, that is key here in promoting transmission in some instances so screening for behavioral risk is super important in this population so you won't know if you don't ask so it's really important to get the key questions out there they can be either open-ended or they can be directed provider comfort is key here you really need to be comfortable with your subject matter many patients appreciate being asked even though you might not feel comfortable they really do appreciate you taking the time and asking the questions and risk is not static in that risk changes over over lifespan you know a young MSM who becomes an older MSM they're, they're what they're doing might change over time depending on you know what's going on with their health and partner risk should always be considered for instance if you think that you're in a monogamous relationship with your partner who's a commercial sex worker your risk is pretty high and that's one thing <laughs> that's one thing you have to keep in mind we I have seen this before um, important behaviors to address you want to make sure that you figure out what they're doing okay their number of partners the genders of their partners the HIV status of their partners a lot of our MSMs actually do serosort you know so with that sometimes they make the decision to not use condoms because they say hey this person has HIV just like me but that might also predispose them to getting other STDs um, you want to know what they're doing in terms of their types of sexual activity are they having oral sex oral being oral a mouth on penis and mouth on anus um, vaginal sex or anal sex or all of the above are they using barrier methods um, condoms dental dams something else that you should know about just ask um, and what are their barriers to safer sex practices because if we don't figure this out we're really not going to make much of a difference so you know once you're in that situation where you're having that conversation make sure it's a confidential environment you want to establish some rapport with the patient you want to be non-judgmental regardless of what you what they say and there can be a range of things that you can hear and I'm sure if you guys work in this area you've heard a range of different responses here um, start with questions that are safe and simple and then expand them to being more complicated use gender neutral terms make them comfortable with what you're asking and try to interview the patient alone sometimes patients try to come with their partners I would like to discourage you from trying to have an interview about sex with the patient and the partner in the room at the same time um, and then consider your message and how you're delivering it so if you're asking have you ever had homosexual sex you're probably not going to get a good outcome here try to rephrase it are your partners men women or both just make it really neutral um, sites of exposure if you're asking have you ever had oral sex rectal sex or just regular sex so what is regular sex in our population I mean we've, we've heard this a lot right patients say I'm just having regular sex that varies so make sure you ask you know be a little bit more specific when you have sex what sites are exposed oral rectal or genital sites and this is really important if you're dealing with transgender patients too who might have various degrees of anatomy you want to know what's going where so you could figure out what you need to screen so I, I like this cartoon so all night drive through screening clinic I'm obligated to inform you that you have the right to remain anxious anything you say will be used to further test you and if you don't already have a diagnosis you will be provided with one by the time you leave so this is what we're doing in STD care right so um, so syndromes I am not going to get through all of these and you know I just wanted to you know put this up here just so you know um, that most STDs are asymptomatic so if you do not look you will not find um, so look that's that's the bottom line there so questions about screening so providers want to know how often who do you screen what tests you're doing what anatomic sites and do you need to treat the partners too so let's go to some of these areas so the STD screening recommendations for HIV positive men and women and this comes from the primary care HIV guidelines so you want to make sure you ask them in terms of symptoms what's going on discharges rashes bumps lumps pain you want to know those things but you also want to screen so chlamydia and gonorrhea you want to check on the sites that are exposed um, syphilis serology you want to do this at least on entry and then annually especially in your MSM population and more frequently based on risk HSV2 serologies in your MSMs that are highly sexually active this might be useful to know um, hepatitis B um, antigen testing good to know that status and you might also want to check hepatitis B immunity because this would be a good time to implement vac vaccination if they are not immune 
Um, you might also want to consider at that time checking hepatitis A status because hepatitis A vaccination is also very good in your MSM population or anybody who has contact with stool based on their behaviors because you want to protect them. And hepatitis C, C serologies. And the new recommendations have at least annually in your MSM population, but you might want to consider it also based on risk. Like if your patient has now you know, become an intravenous drug user or something in the meantime, you, know, you want to probably think about testing that um, at the time of visit. So frequency of visit, of testing. So I touched on that briefly, but basically it's based on risk. So you have annual screening is generally what you want to do. Increase the screening frequency based on risk up to three to six months or sometimes even more. Um, and then I put on here, consider anal pap screening for MSM. I should say that there is um, very little evidence for this at this time, and this, this is not like a, a high evidence point for screening, but some experts do do anal pap screening. It also is uh, center dependent. If you have the capacity for high resolution anoscopy, then this might be something you wanna be considering. But I should say that there's a huge natural history study that's ongoing right now that's gonna try to tease out what, you know, what we're actually doing here, whether we would be impacting the outcome of disease or staging if we do this. So this is something you might just wanna just keep in your pocket, have that as knowledge, but you know, it's not something that's currently evidence-based um, practice at this point in time. So um, recommendations for screening. Um, so nucleic acid amplification tests are currently, I would say, one of the preferred uh, screening methods at this time. Now it really depends on where you work, right? Because some health departments, the only modality that's available is culture. So I'll ask that question right now. Um, how many of you guys are using culture or how many are you using NATS? Culture. Okay, a couple cultures and then NATS for the rest of you? Okay, cool. Um, so NATS are great. Highly sensitive, um, more specific compared to culture, um, less dependent on special specimen collection and handling. Um, the optimum specimens um, for uh, men would be a first catch urine. For women, you can do a self-collected vaginal swab. It's even better than a urine specimen. Uh, and the, when you look at the extra genital sites, the pharynx and the rectal area, you can use NATS there. They are not FDA approved. However, your site might do the validation for this or use an outside lab that's already done it. Um, and um, you know, it's great because you have really good results that you can use. So screening um, for STDs is important because many infections are asymptomatic. And if you look at the slide right here, we can see that um, for rectal infections, the majority of these infections are asymptomatic. So if you don't screen, you won't pick them up. Urethral infections are a little different in that most people are symptomatic when they have them. So uh, the proportion of infections that you will miss if you don't screen, um, the um, recommended sites are actually pretty high. So you wanna make sure, especially up here when you're dealing with gonorrhea, that you look in the appropriate places. So, and that's, that's all relative, I know. Um, so repeat screening. Um, so for your chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomonas, you want to rescreen them in about three months. I should say as a caveat that if you're dealing with chlamydia, you might want to screen them a little bit earlier. So a pregnant female, you might want to screen them again at three to four weeks, and then in the latter stages of their pregnancy, all depending on their level of risk. Um, with men with gonorrhea and chlamydia, they should be rescreened at about three months after treatment, and then syphilis according to um, the current recommendations. Partner management. So uh, you, um, you can do partner referral. You know, patient comes in, has a positive test. You say, hey, tell your partner, come in. We test him. We'll get them treatment at the same time. Um, there is internet-based anonymous notification. Um, that's an interesting process. But, you know, patients, you know, this is one thing. I, I think probably it's better to know than to not know. So if your patient doesn't feel comfortable um, and is not talking to your counselors, it's something you can ask them to do. Um, there's clinic-based referral, there's health department referral, and concurrent patient and partner treatment. Bring everybody, we'll treat everybody at the same time just to make sure that the, the infection doesn't go beyond this room. So expedited partner therapy. Now this map is constantly changing, so it's really good to look at the CDC website for our resources in this area. You guys are here in Florida, so this is, uh, this is not something you wanna do. 
But um, who knows, this might change over time. And you know, that's what's happened in that a lot of states have had an evolving process in terms of EPT. Um, being expedited partner therapy, at that visit, you give the prescription for the partner. They take that home and make sure that the partner is treated. Um, and then there's patient-delivered partner therapy, where some public health clinics, they actually give the patients the medications in the clinic, tell, tell them to take it out to their partners. There are limitations to this. You know, it also depends on how many partners a patient has in your capacity. You definitely <laughs> don't want to be giving out treatments for a whole party. Um, and then health department field delivered treatment. That's when you have your um, EPI people go out in the field and deliver therapy to the patients out there. And there's pharmacy based as well. And this also, like I said, depends on the state that you're in. So let's do a case. So this is Davy. He's having, she's having rectal pain, discharge, and has swollen lymph node. Um, you guys might see this interesting finding right here. I don't know if that gives you a clue as to what's going on. But this is a transgender female. She's had multiple uh, anonymous uh, partners in the last two months. Um, anal receptive and insertive sex, no condom use. So this syndrome, anybody know what this is? When you're coming in with rectal pain, discharge, and we'll, we'll skip this part right now, but rectal pain and discharge, we are dealing with proctitis. So proctitis, um, anal sex exposure, rectal discharge, and pain. Sometimes you can have other things going on like tenismus. Um, this is actually the view through an anoscope, the bird's eye view. And then there you can see there's pus, there's um, blood suggestive of inflammation. Um, and this is the equivalent of friability that you might see on a cervix. This is friability in the anus. Um, and you can also do a grand scan of this and look for white cells there if you need some guidance. But I think pretty much if you see this, you can get an idea that something bad is going on. Um, so what's your differential? So um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, including LGB serol, um, serotypes as well, that's um, L1 through L3, herpes and syphilis. So when you're doing your diagnosis of this patient that's coming in, and you saw that particular clin clinical finding that I had on the picture, you also want to ask if they've had any ulcers at any point in time. Um, so for your testing at that visit, you'd want to consider doing, with this in the differential, uh, make sure that you do your NATS for gonorrhea and chlamydia, you want to make sure um, that you, if there's an ulcer, um, and if you have the capacity, PCR for HSV, um, and syphilis serology if you have it. How many of you have dark field? Okay, totally a dying technology, I understand. It's only being done in a few health departments across the country. Um, but if you did have it, this, if you had an ulcer there, this would be a great point to do a dark field test, versus you can do syphilis screening as well too. And the collection of information should help you come up with your diagnosis. But pretty much, you want to do something at that visit, right? Because this comes back later, but you have chlamydia there in the setting of all those other things. So what you're dealing with is LGV. So LGV, in terms of epi, US and Western Europe, they can have this ulcer, lymphadenopathy, proctitis-related syndrome. It's seen a lot in MSM patients. In heterosexuals, you might not have that complete combination of items. There have been um, case reports in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. Primary disease, that would be your um, ulcer disease, which might be painless. And you can think of the other painless ulcers you have, which includes syphilis. So you want to make sure you, you, you figure this thing out. Um, you can also have um, painful lymph nodes. So you have the painless ulcer and the painful lymph nodes. Um, you can also have rectal pain, tenismus, bleeding, and discharge. In advanced stages or late disease, you can have fibrosis, strictures, and, um, and tracts. And this is where you can have that confusion potentially with um, inflammatory bowel disease. So, you know, it just has to be sort of like in your radar that you could potentially be dealing with this syndrome when you're dealing with an HIV-infected patient. So there is, um, if you don't have testing, you're going to have to epi-treat based on the syndrome that you have before you. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, if you're doing a NAT, they're not going to distinguish between your um, LGV serotypes. Um, if you have capacity for serology, sometimes you can use this as guidance, but again, this is a clinical syndrome. But if you're seeing really high numbers in terms of your serology testing, this would lead you in that diagnosis if you have the other things that fit that picture. Some people use PCRs. These are not widely available, but they are available in some research settings. So treatment, and this is where the important point comes, you know, with your providers distinguishing whether you're dealing with just simple proctitis or whether you're dealing with LGV. 
so you can see how the treatment duration is. So, you're, um, so if you're dealing with proctitis, you, of course you want to cover for gonorrhea and chlamydia, and so that's why you have the ceftriaxone and the doxy here. But notice that the doxy duration is only going up to seven days if you're dealing with proctitis. If you're thinking you're dealing with LGV, then you want to extend that treatment to 21 days in order to provide adequate treatment. So ideally when that patient is there and you're thinking, okay, this could be LGV, but I'm not going to be able to figure it out right now, you would probably want to use your ceftriaxone and your doxy extended to cover for 21 days. If there are ulcers there and you don't know what they are, you don't have the capacity to test, you might want to also go and treat symptomatically for the possibility of HSV, given that that would potentially be in your differential as well. Other chlamydia-based syndromes are here. And we're not going to go in much detail, but other things to you know, look out for that you might have in your patients, reactive arthritis, epididymitis. In women, advanced disease um, would be your um, perihepatitis, endometritis, um, and we're not going to talk about kids. Okay. So in terms of guidelines, changes in terms of chlamydia, there's this additional alternative regimen that has made its appearance. Uh, and this it includes um, the doxycycline delayed, delayed release, um, 200 milligrams Q days for, for seven days. This is just as good as the BID dosing, less GI side effects. So it seems absolutely perfect, right? Cost is a prohibitive factor here for a lot of our patients, so this might not be something that you're able to use. And then again, this is with our non-pregnant patients. You don't want to use doxy in your pregnant patients. For women that are pregnant, um, last, the last guideline iteration in 2010 had both azithromycin um, and amoxicillin listed as preferred regimen. Amoxicillin has since dropped off in 2015. It's now considered an alternative regimen, and that's because um, chlamydia persistence has been documented um, in some cases, which has prompted them to remove that down. So it's been demoted to an alternative regimen in pregnant females. Okay, so Tom is in for a visit. It hurts when I pee. He's a 20-year-old HIV-infected male. He's had a past medical history significant for chlamydia. Um, he's had multiple um, urethral complaints over the years. He reports there are two, two partners that are female. He doesn't use condoms all the time. So what are we dealing here with in terms of syndrome? How does this impact HIV transmission? What's your differential? Okay, we've got to give some treatment here. What are we going to do? So first of all, we'll see this finding right here. Anybody know what this is? So this right here is swelling of the penis, or sometimes some people call it bullhead clap. Um, this is a finding that you can find in a particular STD in some instances. It's definitely not you know, specific, but it's one of those things to keep in mind when you have all these things going on. Okay, so what we're dealing here is a syndrome called urethritis. Incubation can be days to weeks. Discharge may be watery to purulent. You might have this, uh, you might have a symptom of dysuria, or you might not. Or sometimes you can have something vague like penile tingling, or some people report itching. So, urethritis increases HIV shedding and semen. So, this study done by Cohen et al. Um, was done in a patient population um, in Africa. And I should mention that this patient population, they were not being treated for HIV. Um, and so those without urethritis, you can see the number of copies of HIV um, in their semen were lower. Um, those with urethritis, relatively high, and you can see that their, um, their, the persistence of this is still there even after treatment is going on for a while. So with that, you can see how you know, this, this population, if they are both HIV infected and have urethritis, how that increases the likelihood that they could spread the virus to their partners. So in thinking about urethritis, it's important to consider what you're treating. So you have your non-infectious things. So this might be the person who has never had sex, who is there, who thinks, oh my goodness, I have an STD. Um, you want to get a good history from them, chemical, allergic, autoimmune, how often is this happening. If you're thinking infectious, gonorrhea is high on the list. And then you can also think about NGU, and particularly chlamydia, and then MGENT, which is one of the pathogens which is considered an emerging pathogen in this area, is one to consider. And unfortunately, about 30% will be unknown. So despite all of your best efforts, sometimes you just won't figure it out, which is never really encouraging as a provider. But other things to consider, um, so Shrevke et al. did this study where they actually took a closer look at, at you know, some of these patients, and 
you'll see something interesting. So you see these combo things. You see chlamydia and MGEN, chlamydia and TRIC. So you could see how this is quite complicated. That patient that's coming in, you could be dealing with more than one pathogen. In terms of treating, you know, you really need to have some really good modalities to try to figure out what's going on. So along those lines, so how many of you guys have gram stain on site that you can do in your clinic settings? Okay. Another, you know, dying technology. It used to be very popular back in the day. Um, but um, how many of you can send a specimen to a lab? Can you, can you do that? Okay, cool. So if you're doing point of care testing, one thing that's available, um, a really simple form of gram stain or rapid, it's an alternative to the traditional gram stain, which takes a little bit longer, is this test. You can do methylene blue or gentian violet. Um, really fast, it's uh, sensitivity um, and specificity can compare to traditional gram stain. Um, and this is actually mentioned in the current guidelines um, as an alternative. It's um, level of evidence B, so pretty good. Um, so it's something to consider in your clinic setting where you don't, you know, have the time to train for the skill for a complete gram stain or you don't have the time for it. And you can see the results here. This is your traditional gram stain and this is methylene blue and you can, you know, get, get a good look at things still. So your patient, Tom, this is what we see. We have something going on here. So we're dealing with gonorrhea. And these are some of the manifestations we see in here. We're already seeing proctitis, and this is pharyngitis here. And um, so other things that, you know, like I said, we have these things right here. Um, and then if you're dealing with local extension, you can also have um, endometritis, salpingitis in women, prostatitis in men. And more distant infection is your, are your arthritis dermatitis syndromes, um, disseminated gonorrhea. Um, and then you can have bacteremia, which would then lead to meningitis and all these other things right here, too. So we are, you know, in this stage where we're really concerned about resistance. So to give you a little bit on the timeline, we used to use a lot of penicillin back here in the 40s. Then maybe we used too much, and then, you know, then we are not able to use penicillin anymore. Then we started to see cephalosporin failures in the early 2000s as well as fluoroquinolone treatments uh, are moved off of the preferred treatments. Um, and so that brought us to 2010, that rapid tour. Um, and now we recommend dual treatment. So where, where are these cases coming from? So a lot of them are in the West. And disproportionately, they're represented amongst our men who have sex with men population. And what we're seeing historically is a creep up in the MIC, and that's a testing of how well an an, uh, a bug responds to an antibiotic over time. And this right here is for ceftriaxone, which is one of our key drugs that we use. And it's one of the reasons why we also want to use another drug along with it. So are we dealing with super intelligent gonorrhea? <laughs> Maybe. All right. So because of this, we have uh, implemented dual treatment. And dual treatment includes ceftriaxone administered in a single dose. Um, and this is regardless. Um, and then you want to use it with another agent. And this is regardless of the chlamydia testing result. Um, and this other agent um, has, um, has changed. It's moved from doxycycline to now azithromycin. So previously, it used, the guidelines used to state azithromycin or doxycycline but now it's just azithromycin. And that's because doxycycline, um, there have been some concerns about possibly developing resistance within that, type of back, within that type of antibiotic class, so we've just removed it. So it's not really an option. Um, and then for alternative regimens, um, and I say alternatives because, you know, this is not one that we like to encourage. Cefixime is an oral regimen. You want to use that with um, azithromycin if you're, you know, in the situation where you can't use the definitive treatment. In cases of severe allergy, azithromycin, your buddy two grams orally, has been removed from here. It has been removed from here. And I said that multiple times because at least in my, my role in the health department setting, we're still seeing a fair amount of providers that are using the two grams azithro as their crutch for patients that are penicillin allergic. Um, so that's gone. Um, and, you know, the, the concerns were GI intolerance and then also emerging resistance. So that's why you don't want to use the two grams of azithro by itself. But it hasn't completely disappeared. 
um, in that it is um, a co-treatment co for using these alternative regimens, which include gentamicin, um, and you want to use that with azithromycin. Now, the gentamicin dosing, um, it's IM. I know um, for providers who are not comfortable with that so far, they haven't found any really good evidence that it causes major toxicities. It does cause pain at the site of injection, which we know with a lot of our IM treatments. It has to be administered in at least about two injections um, because it would be too painful for one. Um, and some people even split it up to three injections. Um, and then gemifloxacin, which is an oral regimen that can be used along with azithro. But there is a nationwide gemi um, shortage, so this is not an option at this time, but you know, it's one of those oral regimens that hopefully will come out sometime in the future. So test of cure. So when do we go ahead and retest them for gonorrhea? Um, so basically, if, if you use an alternative regimen, particularly of the pharynx, you want to go ahead and retest them probably within 14 days. Um, and then you also want to consider retesting them if you're concerned about treatment failure. So if you're concerned about cephalosporin treatment failure, and let's say that if the patient received an alternative regimen, then you want to switch back and give them the actual recommended regimen. So go with the 250 ceftriaxone, and then you're going to actually up the ante and give them two grams of azithro instead of that one gram of azithro. Make sure that you talk to your local health department. Um, make sure you're heading down the wrong, right path. Um, ensure that the partner gets treated. And in this case, you actually treat the partner with the same regimen as the patient. So if you think that you have failure after you've given the standard therapy, then these are the other options that are available. And again, you would want to contact your local health department. You want to make sure the partners are treated again with the exact same regimen. Um, and you might want to consider doing a test of cure in this case because we really need to try to figure out what we're treating and how to treat it effectively. So Tom is back, believe it or not. He's back at your office. He's been to the emergency department several times since the last time you saw him. He's had multiple testings, and believe it or not, his gonorrhea and chlamydia testing have all been negative. Um, he's had some new partners. Um, he says he's sometimes using condoms. Um, he's reporting now some penile pain, some little tingling, and, and some itching. You have um, capacity to do gram stain, and you're not seeing those, um, those things to point you towards gonococcus this time. So what are we dealing with? NGU. So let's talk about some newer things with NGU. So, uh, so if you, you know, if you had the capacity to do uh, a gram stain in clinic and you could look at your white cells, um, this is this is a huge deal now. So this means that now your cutoff for diagnosis has moved down to two PMNs per high powered field. And why did they do this? They didn't do it to make your life harder. Um, so the reason why they did this is because you're able to detect. 2.5 times more cases, um, 2.5 2 times more percentage of chlamydia is going to be picked up, and you're going to be treating more chlamydia patients once you drop the cutoff point. So that was one of the main reasons why they did this. Because of course, we want to make sure we treat as many patients as we can to decrease the likelihood of transmission. So in summary, NGU, inflammatory symptoms, um, as well as these other symptoms right here, um, Lab criteria can, can include any of these, which include the discharge. You want to have um, at least up to two white blood cells per high power field. Um, if you don't have the capacity to do that, if you have the capacity to do a, u a urine in your lab, um, then you can check for leukocyte esterase if they're there first thing in the morning. Um, and then also if you have uh, first voided sediment with greater than 10 white blood cells, this points you in the direction of NGU if you don't have any reason to suspect you're dealing with gonorrhea and chlamydia. In this case, with our patient, given that he's already had multiple GCCT testing leading up to that visit, it seems to be lower down on the list. NGU treatment. So um, in this case, um, azithromycin is um, top of the list, um, or it says or doxycycline, and I'll tell you why it might be top of the list in a little bit. There are some alternative regimens. Lots of GI side effects from these. Keep that one in mind. If you are suspecting gonorrhea at any point, you do not want to use your fluoroquinolones down here. So, you know, they've been looking at whether azithromycin is superior to doxycycline. And this has come up on, you know, it's, it's one of those things that we're looking at a lot more. And who knows what the future guidelines will show on this, this area. But this particular, um, looking at observational studies, seven with doxycycline, 
and 14 with azithromycin, they found, hey, you know, azithromycin is still doing great. It's still superior to doxy. However, um, efficacy is not consistent, and we might, be, we might be experiencing a decline in that over time. So, uh, so this particular study is interesting by Senya et al., um, looking at patients that are coming into a clinic venue um, at entry, they went ahead and did testing for chlamydia, mycoplasma, trichomonas, vaginalis, um, and they went ahead and treated them, and they had them come back for follow-up visits at one and four-week marks to see how they were doing. So in looking at failure, you'll see clinical failure. One of the things you'll see on here is mycoplasma genitalia is failing more um, in this. And when they took a look at how they were treated, the MGEM patients that were failing were the ones that were getting doxycycline. The chlamydia patients that were failing were the ones who were getting azithromycin. So you can imagine this is a clinical conundrum. If you have a patient where you don't really know what's going on, could it be, and could it be secondary to chlamydia? Could it be secondary to mycoplasma genitalia? Giving one treatment, you know, the, the right treatment for chlamydia might not necessarily be the right treatment for your MGEM. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind, too. And then, um, again, sort of looking at this a little bit closer, so acute urethritis, 15% um, in this, um, looking at this, were um, urethritis for secondary to amgent. In non-gonococcal urethritis, 22% secondary to mycoplasma genitalia. Um, in persistent urethritis, 12 to 14% in men secondary to mycoplasma genitalia. So we're going to see more of this is one of the emerging pathogens in this field to look out for. And um, this is a study that was done in Denmark where they looked at, um, over this, this certain time point, screening from 2007 onwards. They screened a lot of specimens. This was quite impressive. 31,000 specimens from 28,000 individuals were tested for MGENT. And they saw an e increasing trend over time. And this trend, um, this was actually in a general practice population. And the majority of these cases were in men. Um, they also detected a fair amount of macrolide resistance within this population. So it's one thing that we really do need to keep in the back of our mind when they are failing a regimen. Could we be dealing with something other than just garden variety chlamydia in terms of your NGU cases? So the treatment. So, um, so like I said, um, we already talked about treating. Azithromycin is going to be your first line treatment. If they have, so if they got doxycycline with their first round regimen, go ahead and give them azithro this time. If they have sex with women, adding metronidazole is a reasonable thing. We've already seen on previous slides, sometimes you can have combined things going on. So if there's any chance there's trichomonas there, you want to go ahead and treat that. This, however, is not useful in your MSM populations. Do not even bother with that. It won't be of any use. Um, and then um, if azithromycin was given for the first episode, then you want to go to moxifloxacin. Um, do any of your patients have problems getting access to moxifloxacin? Is that, is that a problem that you're seeing out there? Okay. So if you're, you know, generally in a private practice setting or an academic setting, it might not be an issue, um, or it might, depending on cost, but a lot of health departments have managed to acquire this as part of their formulary for this exact same indication. When they fail to treat, be treated with the common regimens, you need to have a good backup. And MOXI would be one of them. And consider adding flagels if, you're, um, if your patient is having sex with women as well. Okay, Sharon's in for a visit. So um, if any of you work in an STD clinic, you are seeing a lot of vaginitis. It's one of the things we commonly see. Um, so a 30-year-old female comes in, she has a history of HIV, um, she comes into the ED, she's having vaginal pain, she's having itching, and this is the type of discharge that you can see there. Um, she reports she has four male partners, two female partners in the last two months. So we're dealing with vaginitis. Um, characterized by vaginal discharge, vulvar itching, irritation, and sometimes odor. It is a common thing. Um, and up to 10 million patient visits per year in the United States are due to vaginitis. So it would be lovely if we had a cure for it. Um, so what are we dealing with? Bacterial vaginosis is top of the list. And then we have these other ones, which are sort of fighting for second and third, um, candidiasis and trichomonas. So if you have the capacity to look under a microscope and do a wet mount, and you're thinking about bacterial vaginosis, then you're going to be using AMSL's criteria, which is our standard criteria. 
If you're receiving, if you're on the lab end receiving the specimens, then you might be looking at Nugent's criteria. So three or four of these things, homogeneous thin discharge, vaginal pH greater than 4.5, greater than 20% clues, and a positive whiff test. So a few things about pH paper. So pH paper should not be tested directly for the specimen from the OS. And that's because it can be contaminated with blood and other things, semen, which would affect the pH. So try to, if anything, try to capture the walls in that process. Um, and that's the one thing I wanted to add there. Um, and with tests, well, some of this is objective. It changes from person to person. But if you have this going on, and this, and that, <laughs> then you are dealing with bacterial vaginosis, OK? But with our patient, um, we might have something else. But with, with bacterial vaginosis, one important thing to think about with our HIV-infected patients, and this study um, was done by Jameson et al., looking at a, um, a population of both HIV-positive and HIV-negative patients. Um, they had 854 HIV-positive, 430-some HIV-negative patients. Looking at them over time, over a five-year period, they found that the HIV-positive patients had more persistent infections. They had more severe infections. So if you're dealing with your patient that's coming back to your clinic over and over and over again for these same complaints, thankfully, the 2015 guidelines have given you a few options. So um, these are a few things they have listed in the guidelines. One of them is suppression with metronidazole gel weekly for up to four to six months. One of them is oral metronidazole, then vaginal, um, boric acid, then, okay, this gets really complicated. Um, and then um, oral metronidazole administered monthly with fluconazole. In this study, they found that this did a great job of repopulating the normal flora in the vagina. Um, but, you know, this is sort of a work in progress. There are tons of people that their everyday jobs to try to figure out a cure to bacterial vaginosis. I don't think they've found it yet. But, you know, the guidelines, you know, this year address other options that might be available for these patients that keep on coming back over and over again with the same complaint. You also want to do good counseling of this group to find out what they're doing. Are they doing douching? Are they putting something in their vagina that doesn't belong there, like perfume or scented products? Um, you know, go through the list. And if it gets to, you know, partner history, maybe they need a new partner. That's not going to happen. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, but you know, it's one of those things that we think about, right? Um, you know, we also need to make sure that we know who the partner is too. And um, in same-sex couples, particularly women who have sex with women, that's one thing to consider. If, you know, if we know that this is what the case is, we might want to bring the other partner in, have them come in for an assessment, check them out, see if there's something going on with them as well too. Um, currently, there, are, there is no guidance on this. There's no specific recommendation to go ahead and treat the partner, however, if it's a female partner who also has a vagina, you might want to see if there's something going on there that's sort of contributing to this constant cycle. All right, but our patient has this. We're dealing with these things right here. So we're dealing with trichomonas. Anybody ever see one of these on exam? You know what that is? So that's a strawberry cervix. The elusive strawberry cervix can be found in less than 2% of cases. So if you have not seen one, don't worry. You are amongst the majority. Um, and this is actually easier seen under colposcopy. But it's one of those things that they tell you to look out for, and it's one of those things you learn about in school. All right, so trichomonas vaginalis and HIV is one of the most common curable STDs in the HIV-infected population. It has up to 44% prevalence. Repeat infection rate is really high, up to 36% in your HIV positive population and that you can see that's significantly different than the HIV negative population. So they do recommend, you know, taking a better look at whether this is actually a contributing factor um, in this population. Because what we do know is that it is associated with higher prevalence of HIV in vaginal secretions and therefore you could see this could increase the potential for tra transmitting HIV to partners. So even though we are excellent as providers, at doing wet mounts. We are not as good as some of these tests on the market. So um, these are some of the newer tests that are FDA approved. You can see great sensitivity and specificity. Um, unlike um, our saline uh, wet mount tests over here, 
So it's one thing to keep in mind, you know, if you're sort of battling, is this trick, is it not trick, maybe consider sending out one of these tests if you have the capacity, might be a good idea. In terms of treatment in your HIV infected population, you want to make sure that you avoid single dose treatment. You want to use a seven day treatment that's going to increase your likelihood of success. And that's pretty much what this slide says. And then these are some options for treatment failure. So um, in pregnancy, um, treat asymptomatic, don't aggressively screen. Keep in mind there is some resistance out there, maybe up to 4 to 10 percent for metronidazole, maybe 1 percent for tinidazole. So if they're failing your treatment and you've already ruled out the possibility their patient is not following the rules, it's one thing to consider and possibly consider testing. There are alternative treatments that are available. Um, and um, there are a number here. Just know that topical treatments tend to fail more than some of the oral treatments. And these are the things that we're dealing with now, the potential for resistance. And then if you're dealing with allergy, consider doing desensitization versus treating a different, um, with a different mechanism. If your patient has it, good chance your partner has it. And so you want to make sure that they get treatment. Okay? And then retesting, you want to retest these women in about three months. Um, and then NATs, you can repeat a NAT if you did one within about two weeks. There's not enough data regarding retesting in men. So, I mean, that it's not there yet, but who knows, that might change with increased testing. So I just wanted to touch on a few issues with syphilis because this is one of those things that we've had some newer data on that more recently. Um, this is the reverse sequence algorithm here. Basically, if you have an EIA positive, then you want to go ahead and check, do a quant quantitative test, check an RPR. And if that's negative, you might want to go ahead and do a TPPA to confirm it. This is a new test that's out on the market. It is FDA approved, and this for point of care testing. This one called the Syphilis Health Check. Cool name. Um, and basically, you um, get your specimen. You put in this little well here, and it's sort of like a pregnancy test. You can have, um, this is your control bar. This is your positive bar. Two lines means a positive test. Um, it doesn't give you data as to titer or things like that, but if you're in a clinic where you're trying to figure out what's going on, this might be a good option. Point on titers. Um, two full, uh, sorry, uh, two tube change or four full dilution um, change is what you're looking for to say whether it's a clinically a relevant change in terms of titers. And I wanted to go to this case really quickly um, because this is relevant to some of the stuff we've heard in the in the media recently. Um, this is a commercial sex worker, 37 year old, who has HIV positive, out of care, comes in with this rash on the hand. Everybody knows what this is: is secondary syphilis. They get an RPR done initially. It is non-reactive. But we see this. This looks like secondary syphilis. Don't ignore it. Go with your gut instinct. Talk to your lab. So repeat RPR is 1 to 1,024. They also have eye symptoms. What is going on here? This is called a prozone phenomenon. If you are suspecting syphilis with a negative RPR testing, then you want to go ahead, talk to your lab, have them rerun it, take a closer look. So basically what's happening is the whole system is being overwhelmed by the amount of antibody they have, and so you're getting a negative test when truly it is positive. It's more common in your HIV-infected patients um, and in neurosyphilis, which is what we're talking about here. Neurosyphilis can happen at any stage in the game. Invasive disease, um, basically you can have abnormal CSF findings, which we have at baseline in our HIV-infected population. They have whites in their CSF more likely if they have a lower CD4 count. But in neurosyphilis, we're talking higher, probably in the number of 20 in their CSF. They might have neurologic findings. Um, they might have hearing loss, altered mental status, um, and, um, or they might be in the latter stage of their disease. Ocular syphilis is something that we need to be alert, alert of. This is something that's happened more recently. Um, again, visual complaints. Um, be aware of prozone um, potential and get them to an eye doctor. They need screening. They need an eye exam, they need serologic tests, they need a lumbar puncture. But if you have a negative lumbar puncture and all those things we talked about, it is still neurosyphilis until proven otherwise, and you wanna go ahead and treat them. And the treatment is aqueous penicillin, um, and they wanna get about 10 to 14 days worth of treatment. And then expert opinion, some people go ahead and do three injections afterwards, one Q week for three weeks, just to make sure you cover for a longer duration of syphilis exposure. Some eye findings, and this is what I was alluding to, the case that they had in, Cal the cases in California um, and in Washington regarding 
um, the outbreaks of ocular syphilis, and these are mostly in the HIV-infected MSM population. The case that I discussed was a commercial sex worker, so she was one of the few females that was in that cohort, um, but clearly at high risk. So go ahead, look out for it, make sure to get an LP, get to the eye doctors, call your health department. Okay. HPV, really quickly. Imiquimod is out there. New change in the guidelines. They now have um, this recommendation for daily treatment that you can use. Awesome, because now we don't have to tell people to take it three times a week, which they'll probably forget. Um, and pedophilin has actually been demoted due to reports of severe systemic toxicity due to misuse. Um, we have preventative vaccines that are out here. Um, if you want to um, treat both your male and your female populations, then we're talking about our quadrivalent vaccine and then our non-avalent, which is just nine valent forms of HPV vaccine. One interesting thing to note here is look at the age group. For men, we're only going up to age 15. Anything, between, anything greater than 15 up to 26 is off-label use of this product, which of course you can do as providers, but you know, it's one thing to keep in mind as well too. So this is, you know, this is our crutch for the, most, for the most part in terms of preventative measures. And lastly, I want to put in a plug here for um, women who have sex with women. Um, even in that population, up to 30% who've never, who, who've never reported having sex with male partners can have HPV disease. So they can also have pap smear abnormalities. You want to make sure you still screen them with routine pap smears and make sure they get the HPV vaccine if eligible. And that's it in a nutshell. Um, look out for this app. It's available in the Apple App Store and Android Store. It's free of charge. It'll summarize all these things that I've just done in my whirlwind tour. Also, people who can help, phone for help at your um, STD prevention training centers. There's also a um, clinical consultation line where you as providers can actually put in like an email consult and get a response from one of the providers, local experts in whatever part of the state you're in. So that's another crutch if you're trying to figure it out and you need clinic and you need help. That is it. Thank you very much for your time. Questions? Okay, if not, we have four from the web. I'll go ahead and read it. Okay, all right. If you can repeat it so it's sure. the web audience can hear it as well. So, does the urine test for chlamydia and gonorrhea cover men who have sex with men, or do you need a rectal swab? Sure. Uh, does the urine test for gonorrhea and chlamydia cover men who have sex with men? So, one of our highest risk populations. So, I, w I will say um, so, in going back to the slides when we talked about infections that can be missed. So sure, if you do the urine test, you're going to pick up a urine infection if it's there, but you will not pick up the other sites. STDs are really site-specific, so you need to test where the infection is. So I would say it's good for urines, but if you're looking for throats and rectums, then you need to test those areas. Okay. Um, is the anal cap for HPV a separate test than rectal swab done for other STDs? Yes, that's a very good question. So the um, test for rectal STDs is typically either you're going to do a culture or you're going to go do a nucleic amplification test, which are two different uh, techniques and tests. Uh, the anal pap is basically a Dacron swab inserted about two inches into the rectum um, and um, sent over to your lab for pathology reading. So it's a completely different test. So far, they haven't found a way to blend that with the, um, with the rectal STD test, but who knows, depending on whether it becomes a trend in the future, we, we might see that, who knows. Is the anal cap recommended for high-risk asymptomatic individuals who are engaging in receptive anal intercourse? And if you could just repeat that. So. Sure. Um, is the anal pap recommended for high-risk uh, asymptomatic individuals who are presenting for care? Who is that? Engaging, Engaging in anal receptive intercourse. Right. So, um, so the issue of anal pap that's come up on a few of the guidelines has come up on the 2050 gu 200, 2015 guidelines as well as the primary care guidelines and is still not currently evidence-based screening. I, I just want to emphasize that. Um, but it is being done in some centers where they do have experts, where they have capacity to both read the pap smears and also do higher level evaluation and treatment. Um, so for those experts that do do it, they, they, the selective audience, the people that they pick to screen are your high risk MSM and even your high risk women. So women who are engaging in anal sex, people who have both, uh, who have cervical or vulvar disease are also at risk as well in terms of women. 
So um, in centers where they do have that level of expertise, they are screening these high-risk individuals. And anal receptive intercourse is not always a criteria for having anal HPV disease. Um, we have seen that in um, our immune compromised tr uh, populations, transplant populations, which can still have um, anal HPV disease. Um, it's also found in women, like I said, anatomically. Vulva and labia are really close to the anus, so if you have disease there, it's possible that you can have it at the anus as well, too. And then last question sure. for those anal packs, how did they pay for them? Very good question. Uh, that might be the million dollar question. Um, so currently, like I said, because this is not standard of care, um, there are some uh, insurance companies that will pay for it and there's some that, that aren't. And, you know, they have that option because it's not, you know, it's not standard of care. Um, so if you are in a part of the country where you have access to um, an academic center, there is a large natural history study that's currently being going on. It's taking place in the United States as well as internationally, where they're trying to answer this question. They're trying to figure out what is the natural history of anal HPV disease. The same thing like with cervical cancer, how we know that screening <coughs> improves outcomes. Um, so, I mean, that's a possibility. If you can access um, a research study site for this, this um, uh, disease, then that's one place where you can get it done free of charge as part of a research study um, versus um, if your insurance plan covers this procedure. So um, it might be location specific and even patient specific if this is something that they're interested in having. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone so much for participating today. Do not forget to complete your evaluation. You're going to get that email link. Um, Karen, is there anything else I need to mention other than the evaluation? Your PIF form, yes, your PIF form. Please complete that. <clears throat> for on-site people, you'll leave it out front. And for our web audience, you're completing that online. So thank you so much uh, for being here today. Thank you.